Um, so I'd like to introduce Nicole, who's the Director of the Department for Marine Microbiology at the Max Planck Institute right here in Bremen, Germany. Um, so why don't you take it away, Nicole? Thank you. Um, I'll share my screen. I think I'm fine now, right? Yep. Okay, the only thing I don't see is the timer, but I'll just use my iPhone. Um, so I'm fine. Um, so most model organisms in the life sciences are not marine. And uh, here's a, a recent, um, actually recent 2019 tweet um, from EMBL. I hope uh, that whoever tweeted this at EMBL will forgive me. They got um, actually quite uh, some flack immediately with people saying, well, what about plants? And what about fish, zebra fish mainly, which are freshwater? And what about frogs? Um, I don't see a single marine organism here. And uh, there was in 2015, admittedly, um, but until very recently, an actually beautiful volume of uh, articles about model organisms and not a single one of these is marine. Well, these are uh, really, uh, it's a shame because the highest diversity of life, of course, is in the oceans. There are many, many, many more phyla in the oceans. This is from a recent summary of all the uh, microorganisms of all the plants and animals that occur in the oceans. And so, of course, um, we, we very much restrict our understanding of biology and the life sciences by uh, focusing so strongly, at least in the past, on a small number of genetically tracked evolved, um, mainly terrestrial organisms. But these are wonderful times to be a marine biologist uh, in the life sciences. Uh, that recognition has reached many institutes. These are just some examples of a program called the Aquatic Symbiosis Genomics Project that Welcome Sanger together with the Moore Foundation has put together. And you'll be hearing in the talk after mine, um, the emphasis that EMBL is putting on marine research and planetary biology, uh, and also working together with the Tara uh, Ocean Foundation to look at our oceans. So I want to tell you about the research that we do in my lab. It's on chemosynthetic symbioses, and these were discovered only 45 years ago in the deep sea. And I th say only 45 years ago because that's still in the lifetime of the scientists that were around when they discovered it. And it's also the last major ecosystem on earth that has been discovered. I argue that we will not discover any large ecosystems like the ones in the deep sea that were uh, discovered thanks actually to technology submersibles. These are gigantic ecosystems. Uh, the researchers were extremely surprised to see such large animal ecosystems in the deep sea because they thought these were always dependent on light the biomass is tremendous, as large as tropical rain, rainforests or coral reefs, and the majority of this biomass is based on microbe-animal symbioses. And the reason for that is because the microbes can use the energy sources at the vents that the animals are normally, uh, that animals can't use. And I'll explain that in a second, that's chemosynthesis. Um, what I'd like to emphasize is we discovered these uh, amazing symbioses in the deep sea at 3,000 meters water depths off the Galapagos Islands, and then soon discover that they also occur at cold seeps, whale falls. But what is remarkable in retrospect is that uh, they're actually in very shallow coastal water sediments, and zoologists had often wondered why animals uh, didn't have a mouth or gut and had some very odd structures in their bodies. These were symbiotic bacteria. They couldn't interpret them properly until the deep sea symbioses were discovered and people went back and looked at them in more detail. So how do these symbioses work? In photosynthesis, it's the energy from the sun that is used by chloroplasts, which are essentially also symbionts or derived from cyanobacteria. And they use that light energy to fix CO2 into biomass and that's transferred to the plants. What you have in chemosynthesis is that the chemical energy that, uh, for example, seeps out of the hydrothermal vents, reduce gases like hydrogen sulfide and methane, they are used by the symbiotic bacteria to fix CO2, and that is then transferred to the animals. That's why we call it dark energy, because it's independent of photosynthesis. Um, what you're seeing here is a tree that we put together of all the different 
uh, bacterial lineages that have formed symbioses with animal hosts. And what we now know is that these types of symbioses are not rare. They have evolved independently of each other numerous times in convergent evolution. At least 15 bacterial groups have been able to uh, come together with hosts. And at least two protists and nine animal groups have established these symbioses. And what that tells us is there's a strong selective advantage for both partners in coming together in these associations. These are some of the hosts that we study. Um, and these uh, quest the questions that we ask are ones where organismal biologists, so we try to understand the entire uh, organism in its setting. First, how do the symbiotic partners interact? How do they interact with the environment? And how does the environment affect the symbioses? And what are the evolutionary processes that have shaped these symbioses? And we use a wide range of tools field work when we go out and collect them, quite a bit of imaging work that I'll be showing in, um, in a few slides from now, incubations in the lab and displacement experiments, and then omics, which I'll also present briefly. For the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus in on the deep sea mussels that we work on, they're called bathymodialis mussels. And so far, nobody has been able to cultivate chemosynthetic symbios symbionts. But what we can do is keep the hosts in aquaria over many years and manipulate them. And I'll first show you the imaging work that we've been doing on these symbioses. And these are the, uh, the uh, researchers that have been doing it, Nico Deich, Benedict Gaia, and Max Frank in my lab. So this is a, a microcomputed tomography image of a deep sea bathymodialis muscle. And the gills are the symbiotic organ. They carry the symbiotic bacteria and they're greatly enlarged compared to their shallow water relatives like the blue mussel that don't have symbionts. And the reason they're so enlarged is they're packed full, and I'll show you images, they're packed full of bacteria. They have, we estimate um, about 10 to the 12 bacteria cells in a single mussel of only eight centimeter size. And they only have two bacterial species, one sulfur oxidizer and a methane oxidizer. So they're like a real chemostats uh, that you can look at and study in detail. Let's zoom into what they look like. This is a muscle on a half shell. When you open it up, these two dark structures are the greatly hypertrophied gills. And now what we're going to do is look at a cross section through a single filament here um, of one of the gills. They are composed of thousands and thousands of gills. And we use fluorescence inside to hybridization to look at the symbionts. We use a probe that's specific here to the sulfur oxidizing symbiont. And you can see that it occurs here in yellow in the host cells. And there's a methane oxidizing symbiont here in purple. What you can also see is that immediately adjacent to these symbiont containing cells, the bacteria sites, there are also cells that the bacteria don't colonize. And this is very cool. Even within the same symbiotic organism, there's a clear differentiation where the host is saying, I'll let you colonize some cells, but I won't let you in other cells. And these are mainly the cells they use where they're packed full of mitochondria uh, to beat their cilia and to get uh, oxygen. We're going to zoom in now into a single host cell, into a single bacteria site using electron microscopy. What you can see here, um, and I'd like to actually explain this a little bit better, each single filament here is surrounded by seawater. Um, and inside is the host hemolymph tissue. So it's like an epithelial tissue, a single celled epithelial tissue. And this is the outside here of the cell where the seawater is filtered through by the muscle and the symbionts sit inside the cell. Um, the, the symbionts here, we're zooming in and again, what we have inside here is the hemolymph, outside here are the epidermal cells, the epithelial cells of the gill tissues. This is the seawater here on both sides of such a filament. And uh, these black blobs are not bad electron microscopy. They're actually gigantic phagolysosomes. And what happens is that the tissues have been modified so that they digest these symbionts. They're eating their symbionts. There are other adaptations. We know that the um, epithelial cells lose their microvilli. It's called microvilli effacement. And this is a process that is well known from pathogenic bacteria. It's hypothesized that pathogenic bacteria enter host cells and actually 
uh, caused the, 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 the loss of these microvilli to close the door behind them. We also see that the gut system becomes greatly simplified compared to uh, the shallow water mussels that have to spend a lot of energy filtering plankton. That's hard to eat. That's like grass. Um, it's a lot of hard work. They've got a looped intestine. And we see that the intestine here has become very, very straight in the mussels because they're getting their nutrition in a very easy manner. So one of the questions in imaging that we've zoomed in, in is, are these symbionts really intracellular? Because it really matters for the entire understanding of the association if they're intracellular or not. And one of the things we noticed in electron microscopy were these openings, very small openings of 50 to 70 nanometers, sometimes 100 nanometers. And we said, well, that's interesting. Um, are, they, are they actually open to the outside environment? Because these are such small openings, you can't really use two-dimensional sectioning to go through them in a 3D manner. And so we were very excited after I gave a talk at EMBL that we had the opportunity together with Yannick Schwab and Nicole Schieber uh, to use their FIPSIM, their focus ion beam scanning electron micro microscope uh, to scan through an entire deep sea muscle cell. And uh, for those that are not familiar with this, it's, it's very time consuming. It takes three days to go through a single host cell. Um, and it's actually, we're still working on the data. So I think four to eight, eight weeks of analysis time is an underestimate of the wonderful data that we get. So this is what we see. We're now go a FIPSEM um, bacteria site and uh, we're looking at it in 3D. It's uh, uh, being now we're going to zoom into the surface of this bacteria site. And now in red, you're going to see all the little pores that are there. We estimate uh, that there are thousands and thousands per host cell. The neighboring cell does not have simions. It does not have these pores. It has its microvilli, but these pores or openings are specific to the cells that contain the simions. And now we're going to go down um, in a cross section into the host cell, you can see that these are openings. They're clearly opened uh, to the outer seawater and the bacterial symbionts, false colored here in green, are sitting in a tunnel space just below the outer surface of the host cell. And so you could say, well, you know, who really cares because, you know, whether they're really intracellular or in this tunnel system, uh, what does that really mean? It means a, um, a lot in terms of thinking about host microbe interactions. When it, that we now know that the symbionts um, are extracellular, it means that they are uh, physically intimate with each other. This means that there's huge opportunities for genetic exchange, just like the human microbiota in the gut, and they have direct access to the seawater circula uh, circulating in the muscle. So it's change also to any of the uh, components that are in there. There are something like 5,000 openings in the host cell. And what we're very interested in now finding out is what are the cytoskeletal proteins on the host side that can induce this tunneling system? As far as we know, nobody has seen these types of openings before in an animal host. I'm going to move on uh, for the last part of my talk. Um, let me just check my time because I still can't see the timer, which is fun. I have five more minutes uh, to the omics that we do. Um, and this is the team of wonderful researchers that have been working on our omic analyses. And what we are trying to identify is go below the species level with symbionts to the strain level. And I just like to emphasize that's not trivial particularly if you can't cultivate organisms as is often done when people are looking at strain diversity. And so we're using um, meta genome, assembled genomes and analyses to look at them in more detail. And we're looking at four different host species that we've collected uh, on the mid-Atlantic ridge, hydrothermal vents that occur uh, in the middle of the Atlantic. Based on 16S, which is the characteristic gene that is used to look at microorganisms, we know that each muscle species has a single muscle symbiont. But 16S is a really conserved marker, and it's not showing you uh, uh, the type of diversity that really matters in the evolution of animals at a time scale that is relevant. That's why it's so important to also go down to the strain level in microbiology. 
And what we found with Illumina and PAC bio sequencing is that, um, and by the way, this is for the sulfur oxidizing symbiont. So forget the methane oxidizing symbiont for the rest of the talk. For the sulfur oxidizing symbiont, as many as 16 strains can co-occur in a single host individual. And when we presented, first presented these results, the evolutionary biologists said, well, that really can't be what you're seeing because our theories predict um, that in these types of intracellular symbioses, these strains having multiple strains means they would compete with each, with each other for space and resources to the detriment of their host. So how can we explain it in these muscles? We know from the wonderful work that is increasingly being done in re high resolution on host microbe associations, including the human gut. What matters is where are the organisms located, host genetics matter and environment. So as I presented, our imaging analyses um, indicate, um, first of all, that they may have access to the environment that may shape strain diversity it is also possible that there's a spatial separation with each host cell harboring only a single symbiont strain. And we're uh, just in the process of doing PAC biosequencing of single host cells in an attempt to resolve whether that is true or not. What we do know is that host genetics does not play an important role. In, and I'll just briefly explain to you, there's a hybrid zone where a species from the north and south hybridize. And what we know from their phylogenomic analyses, but also from uh, single nucleotide polymorphism analyses and presence and absence is that genetics, at least uh, in short term evolutionary time spans don't play a role. And so I'll finish up actually with saying what does play a role and that is the environment. Um, what we know is that there are, this is, this is mapping of uh, Lumina reads to a consensus sequence of the symbiont in a single muscle individual, is that there are regions where um, not all of the reads map. These are low coverage genes, they're strain specific. And 80% of these genes we were not able to annotate, that's typical for metagenomics, but we lucked out with the 20 that we could. And these are genes that will be critical for the ecology and evolution, virus defense genes, toxin-related genes, and metabolic genes. And I'm emphasizing that these are expressed genes, and many of them, by the way, acquired through horizontal gene transfer. And so these are just some of the genes, and I will finish up with the last two, three slides showing why the environment matters with one gene um, that is used to use hydrogen as an energy source. We were able to show this in 2011 that in addition to sulfide and methane, these muscle symbionts can use hydrogen. And what we see in the strains that uh, in the muscles and the different strains is that hydrothermal vents with very high hydrogen concentrations, this is a geological process that I, I won't go into now, 100% of the strains have the genes that allow them to use hydrogen as an energy source. At another event site where the hydrogen concentrations are extremely low, only a small percentage of the strains in each muscle individual have the genes that allow them to use it. And at Lucky Strike, there are intermediate hydrogen concentrations. And there we see that um, about 50 to 75% have it. So uh, we also imaged this and could show that indeed uh, there's a variability in the strains that have them. And I'll finish up. Um, let me just make sure because I still don't see the timing, but I think um, I'm actually 30 seconds over. So I'll finish up uh, with just summarizing the advantages of strain diversity. Uh, the uh, host is able to continuously change symbiont strains, both with co-occurring hosts and with free living bacteria. And it allows uh, the muscles to adapt to the environment within their own lifetime. They don't have to wait for evolution. Um, and I'd like to thank the many people uh, in my lab, in my department, and the sources of funding uh, that have supported this research and you for your attention.